didn't just keep coming to church just as you are, but the promise is you're not going to stay the way you are because the same God that delivered me is the same God that will deliver you. The same God that transformed me is going to transform you. The same God that changed me is going to change you. The same God that healed me is going to heal you. I just want to preach and continue along the line. We're going to conclude this amazing series that we titled Forever Changed. We're looking at the lives of people that Jesus encountered and changed the trajectory of their life. They were headed in one direction. They were living a lifestyle, and they had this moment of exchange, interaction with Christ And it changed their priorities, it changed their purpose, it changed their interests, their loves, their likes. Just an encounter with Christ radically changed. You're here today because uh, Christ changed your life. You're here today because you're inquisitive. Can Christ change my life? We're going to talk a little bit about how his love, his mercy, his grace, his power, his Holy Spirit causes this significant radical change in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read you a little bit to talk about the state that we were in, why people come to Christ, the way the world functions, so that we can gain a little bit of understanding. The Bible says this, and you having made alive who were spiritually dead and separated. That's the state we were in. All mankind is spiritually dead. They're not physically dead. They're spiritually dead, and they're separated from God. Now, how did that happen? Because of our transgressions and our sins have separated us. In which once, this is, notice this word once. That's supposed to be once upon a time, not still. Once upon a time, we walked according to the course of this world, the world, the ways of the world, influenced by this present age, In accordance with the prince and power of the air, Satan, the spirit who is now working in the disobedience, the unbelieving, who fight against the purpose of God. Hold on. I thought what I was doing is because I wanted to do it. I thought I was choosing. I didn't know that there was this other entity influencing my passions, my desires. Yeah, it's called Satan, and he says it right there. He influences the ways of this world, the culture of this world, the entertainment of this world, the pleasure of this world, the music of this world. The enemy is trying to get in. Now, we have a choice whether we're going to allow him or not, but most people feed and they give heed to that knowing no better. The Bible goes on and says, among these unbelievers, we all, there's that word again, once, supposed to be past tense. Lived in the passions of the flesh. I don't know about you. I did whatever my flesh wanted to do. And usually there wasn't a whole lot of restrictions on that. I lived according to my fleshly nature. No matter what that was. Our behavior governed by our sinful self. Indulging in the desires of human nature. I indulged myself. I never felt guilty I never felt condemned. I never said, oops, now I got to be good for a couple days because I was really bad last night. The Bible says we indulge the impulses of our sinful mind. And we're by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath just like the rest of mankind. Because of sin, God's wrath was on our life because there's a consequence of sin and that sin brings out God's wrath. God hates sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin that you and I once committed. And that sin is going to cause God one day to have to be a righteous judge to judge the sin of mankind. And because of that, that is going to be seen as wrath being poured out. He goes on, he says, Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles by birth, who are called uncircumcision, by which is called excuse me, who call themselves circumcision, itself mere mark, mark, itself a mere mark which is made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that at that time, watch this, notice these strong words, remember, at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from any relationships with him, third word, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, fourth word, strangers to covenants of promises who with no share in sacred uh, messianic promises and without knowledge of God's 
agreements, having no hope in the promise and living in the world without God. Strong terminologies. See, what am I trying to say? This is what the world does not understand. This is what unsaved people do not understand. See, I, I'm, they'll say I'm basically a good person. I have a good income. I, I support humanitarian efforts. Are you trying to tell me I'm bad? No, I'm not telling you you're bad. I'm showing you what the word of God says that you and I are outside of Christ. And that's what they don't understand because we don't have a way of explaining it properly. We just tell people that don't know Christ, God hates you, you're going to go to hell, and you better get right. I mean, who wants to turn to Christ with that kind of message? But if you break down the word and show the state that they're, they don't know no better. They don't know no better. They don't know nothing but sin or anger or hostility or bitterness or retaliation or getting even or drowning your sorrows away. So you and I have to be able to articulate the nature that exists within us. It's a nature and that nature has to be killed. And the only way to kill that nature is not self-willed, but the cross of Calvary kills that nature. Until then, you will live according to the fads, the trends, the ways of this world, and whatever you you want to do and you'll say I have no choice I'm born this way this is who I am because that's your nature that's why you have to be born again and that can only come through Christ now if you're new to faith that might just be overwhelming you're like your head spinning like preacher I hear you but I don't know what the heck you're talking about that's okay because I'm really grateful that you trusted enough to come but here's what I'm trying to tell you today God can forever change somebody. And what you and I do not remember that we used to be, we will repeat it again. If you don't remember, you'll probably repeat it. And if you don't remember it, they'll pro you will probably have no indebtedness nor gratitude over what he's done for you. There are great stories of forever change in the Bible. Ruth was a pagan worshiper and she was ever changed by what God did in her life. Rahab was a whore. She was a brothel queen. But God changed the trajectory of her life. These became, these became great grandmothers in Jesus' lineage. That's how radically changed they were in their lives. There are other people that were radically changed. Jacob was radically changed. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. And he was radically changed in his life. We talked about Saul, how he was a murderer. And God absolutely changed the trajectory of his life. How about Zacchaeus? He had found wheat, wealth. He had found prestige. He had money. He had fortune. But he was empty on the inside. Which is really a picture of so many people's lives. I have everything the world told me to have. But why am I still searching? Why am I empty? Because you're a Zacchaeus. You've earned everything you know to do, but there's still, if you be honest, Zacchaeus, if you be honest with yourself, take away your money, take away your fans, take away the noise, I'm still empty on the inside. Why am I empty? Because only Christ can fill the emptiness of one man's life. Everyone, we want to thank you for watching Real with Diego. If you would like weekly updates on upcoming episodes, please visit and like our Facebook page. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You know, without each and every one of you, this show wouldn't be where it is. We couldn't do it without you. So make sure you like, repost, and share. We want to stay connected with you. The more sharing, the better. We really want to hear from you, so don't hesitate to message us as well. And if you're ever in the Inland Empire, please come out and visit. We'd love to meet you. We just need you to do one simple thing. Come as you are. I say it a hundred times and I'll say it a thousand more times. This church is dedicated. This church is dedicated to people that are ex-somethings in this. We are all a whole bunch of ex-somethings in this place that have been saved by grace. And now we feel the obligation not to forget the world we came from, but to go back and try to save people that are in that world. And this church is a church that's not ashamed of his story that he's done in my life. See, your testimony is not your testimony. It's his testimony. Because you didn't save yourself, you didn't deliver yourself, and you didn't set yourself free. But we seem to hold God captive because we won't tell the story. Now, when we don't tell the story, here's the reality. Then I must be, I must be in fear that I'm going to go back to it. 
You say, oh, no, 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 that's not the reason. Well, then you must be ashamed of it. You must, but the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, he no longer remembers your iniquity. So why are you ashamed of it? The Bible says you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Why would you be ashamed of it? Let God use it as a trophy in the face of the enemy and go tell somebody. See, people get saved because you tell your story and then you tell Jesus' story. We get this reverse. This is reverse. We try to tell Jesus' story and they have no relationship with us, so they say, prove it. Let me see the change in your life, and you stand back as a, don't know how to prove it. But once you tell your story, I used to be, and I used to do this, and I once upon a upon time was this, but look at how God has radically changed my life. You've seen it. I've been working with you. I've been your neighbor. I've been your friend. Now, let me tell you the story, his story. They're more apt to open to receive it. But you, if you just want to tell his story without telling your story, it sometimes does not connect well. So watch the screen as they tell another story of transformation and being forever changed. My name is Phil Coda. Um, I was born in Glendale, California. I was raised in Moreno Valley, California. I was a member of Outlaw Motorcycle Club, uh, one of the baddest in the nation. And about two and a half years ago, I was in a motorcycle accident that I almost lost my life. My whole foot was almost detached from my, from my leg. I was in pretty bad shape. I, I'm married, I have two kids. I was shacked up at my parents' house because of the accident. The club's trying to get me to come back, and I'm thinking about the club and not my family, so my priorities weren't right. So maybe a year and a half later, I'm getting back on the bike prematurely, and I'm on the freeway riding with my patch and brothers, and something comes up and hits me. It broke my tibia in half. And it was at that point the, the club kind of turned their back on me and, and stopped talking to me, put me on, on, a, on a medical leave. I was upset at that time because these guys that, that I would, you know, um, give my life for basically just kicked me to the curb because I was in a, a, another accident in two years. Um, so I was looking for something else. I had a full leg cast on my leg, the doctor said, for 10 weeks. So I'm laying in my bed. My wife is very upset at me. My parents are upset at me. My club brothers are upset at me. You know, that's when you go to God. When everything's, when everything's bad in your life, people go to God. When there's always something happening, um, that's when you go to God. And I asked, I asked God a question. I said, why me? What, what did I do to deserve this? And he answered me clear. Never been to church before. Well, I, my, my family was Catholic, but I didn't get nothing out of it. I just went because they made me. So, but I've never like wanted to be in church. And when I asked God, why me? What did I do to deserve this? He said, because I love you. And um, you gotta, you gotta understand me. I'm like, love, like this, that's love? Like this, this has gotta be the true meaning of tough love. I said, if this is love, if it's because you love me, do whatever you have to do to humble me and drop me to my knees and surrender for you. And he said, I just did. And it was clear as day. And, and it was at that moment I knew that I wasn't in control. I was never in control. And, and that um, I needed something else in my life. I thought it was the club, but it wasn't that. It was the love of Jesus Christ that I needed in my life. When I first came to, to church, February 19th, 2017, I'll never forget Pastor Diego said, at the end of his sermon, come for the next 12 months as much as you can every time the doors are open and watch how God drastically changes your life. I, I, I answered the call, I did it. I came every, every day that I could. Wednesdays, Saturdays, Sundays. I joined the leadership class, I'll come Tuesdays. I would come Friday for prayer. Um, I was just here as much as I can so that there could never be no, no, thought of, oh, it didn't work. I didn't want to take one step in and then and there still be a chance that it doesn't work. I went all the way in 
And, and because of that, I, I think I'm truly blessed to, to be here, like to even be alive, for my family to, to love me as much as they do. Me and my wife have a relationship that, that I never could even imagine. Um, my kids love coming to church. You know, I feel like God's helping me do the right thing for my family. And without that, I, I wouldn't be here today. Um, my name's Phil Coda, and I've been forever changed. Hey everyone, we want to build a relationship with you. If you have any questions or simply want to reach out and let us know how you feel, please message us. Or you can visit our Facebook page and leave a comment, even send a video if you like. However you want to share your life, we're down. Just be sure to do one simple thing, come as you are. In Mark 5 and verse 1, then they came to the other side, that's Jesus and his disciples, to the sea, to a country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, Jesus crossed over the sea for one purpose, for one man who didn't know him. Can you have that courage to come out of your way to walk across the room for one person that doesn't know Jesus? And immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Notice all these words now who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, no, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, incarcerated, in prison, symbolic and literally. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Nothing to try to help him could work. I tried everything. It goes on, it says, neither could anyone tame him. Always night and day he was in the mountains in the tombs crying and cutting himself. He's suicide. He wants to end his life. Nothing works. Nothing can help. He's crying in grief and sorrow. And when he saw Jesus from afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So many of us are like this man. We have two personalities. We have two things in us working at the same time. One of us wants to do right. The other wants to do wrong. One of us wants to know God. The other one doesn't want to know God. There's this good and this bad going on within us. This man, part of him, wants to fall on his knees and worship and recognize that God is the only one that can deliver my life. Then the other voice speaks up and says, don't you torment us, Jesus, before our time. And that's the way so many people are. There's a good side, there's a bad side. I will to do something, but I don't seem to have the courage to change. That's the state of this man's life. But it goes on and it says this. For he said to him, Jesus said to him, come out of that man unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is his name? Then he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he also begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. This man, the word legion is descriptive of 6,000. If you were a legionnaire, you had 6,000 soldiers under you. So this man had at least 6,000 problems, 6,000 issues. He had 6,000 devils and demons. He had 6,000 addictions and bondages and oppressions in his life. He had 6,000 troubles in his life. He was full of 6,000 personalities, pretty big. The Bible says, now there was a large herd of swine feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And Jesus at once gave permission. Then the unclean spirit went out of that man and he entered the swine. And there, excuse me, there were about 2,000 and the herd ran vitally down the steep place into the sea and drowned into the sea. God doesn't waste word. The Bible is very relative for us, but we, we sometimes have to search it a little bit to find its meaning and significance. First of all, you've got to recognize that the devil and demons recognize that Jesus has more authority than them. That ought to say something to you right now. The problem is, is mankind doesn't believe that Jesus has authority, but devils and demons recognize, Jesus, I need your permission. Please allow. You have the ability to do this. 
The second thing is, is Jesus cast that spirit into pigs. If you know anything about Jewish history, the most unclean animal in, in, in Jewish society is the pig. The pig. It's an unclean animal. And that's where the devil needs to exist. That's where the devil belongs. That's where the devil is comfortable. In unclean, perverted, distorted, freaky atmospheres is where you will see the greatest demonic oppression. He goes into the swine, the swine. Run. The third thing I recognize is the devil is so stupid. He's not omniscient because he wouldn't have asked to go into the pigs because Jesus knew the pigs are going over the cliff. They're going to die and you don't have a dwelling place no more. That's how stupid the devil is. He doesn't even know the future of what's going to happen. So the Bible goes on and it tells this and it says, uh, so those who uh, fed the swine, so, so it says those who fed the swine fled. So all these herders, these owners of pigs, they went and they told it to the city and in the country and they went out to see uh, that which uh, had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion. So watch this. He's sitting, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened. How did this happen? This guy's a crazy guy. Now he's sitting, he's clothed, and he's right mind. How did this happen? Who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Watch this. You would have thought that all these people that came out from the city, because here's the real picture. These people in that city of Gadara were tormented. They were tormented by the devil and that man. They couldn't go to the grocery store. They couldn't let their kids go out to the park. Everyone was scared because this man was the bad man of Gadara. Nobody could buy, you could send SWAT, you could send the FBI, and you could send police, and he flew him out like a superhero. Nothing could bind this man. He was crazy, full of the devil. So all of a sudden, Jesus delivers the man that's your problem. Then Jesus takes away all the pigs from your life. And instead of you saying, thank you, Jesus, can we cook you a meal? We are so grateful. Notice what they do to him. And when he, so, so they begged him that he would depart from the region. And when he got into the boat, he, when he had got in the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but he said to him, go home, go to your friends, tell what great things the Lord has done for you, how God has had compassion on you or mercy. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. What an amazing story. Notice the word, go tell people the marvelous things that the Lord has done for you and how God had mercy on you. None of us would be here without the mercy of God. Mercy interjected, mercy intervened. Mercy said that's enough. Mercy is not something you merited or something you earned. In the mercy of God, you are here today because you walked away from a childhood disease. That was mercy. You walked away from an accident that should have cut your head off. What was that? Mercy. You should have been busted. You should be in jail right now serving life sentences. You may have been on death row, should have died, but the mercy of God intervened. You should have been busted. You should have been caught. You should have, as much drugs as you took, you should have overdosed. As much booze as you drank, you should have killed yourself. What happened? The mercy of God. You need to tell that story. What happened to me because of the mercy of God? The mercy of God didn't allow me to get raped. The mercy of God didn't allow me to get pregnant. The mercy of God didn't allow me to get kidnapped. The mercy of God didn't allow me to get molested. The freaky life that I was living. And even if bad things happen to you, the mercy of God kept you alive, at least though it happened. There's a purpose. And you must search whether you believe in Christ or not, why it happened. Why didn't I die? There must be a greater purpose. You are watching Real with Diego. Hey, I want to tell you that there are a lot of gurus, philosophers, theorists, and leaders out there that claim to be Lord, Savior, or God. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Jesus alone 
And Jesus stands in a crowd all by himself. Jesus is the only one to have said that he would die, be buried, and in three days be raised from the grave. Jesus is the only one that defeated the sin factor in people's lives. Jesus is the only one that can offer forgiveness. Jesus is the only one that defeated death. Jesus is the only one that conquered the enemy. Jesus is the only one that rose from the grave. I want you to know today, at the end of the day, Jesus is the only one that really loves you unconditionally. You don't have to merit anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to achieve anything. Jesus only and alone loves you. So today, I want you to recognize that Jesus alone is Lord and Savior. He is the only one that can rescue us, redeem us, and save us from our sins, our disobedience, our shames, our guilt, our regrets, our past pains. He alone can make the slate clean. I want you to know today, he stands all by himself as the undefeated and proclaimed champion of the universe. He alone can save you no matter where you are, wherever you're hurting today, wherever you're lost, wherever you're empty, wherever you feel forgotten, wherever you feel left out, Jesus alone can save you. I want you to know today, if you're ready, I want you to say this with me. Jesus, I recognize that you only and alone can save me of my sin. And today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Hey, thanks for following us. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for sharing this program. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Live for Jesus. God bless. Hey everyone, we want to build a relationship with you. If you have any questions or simply want to reach out and let us know how you feel, please message us. Or you can visit our Facebook page and leave a comment, even send a video if you like. However you want to share your life, we're down. Just be sure to do one simple thing, come as you are. Hey, I want to personally invite you to our church. There are a lot of great churches, and I want you to experience any Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. But I think our church is the greatest. If you're ever in the area, I want to personally invite you to our church. We welcome anybody and everybody. If you're tall or if you're short or you got a great education or you don't have an education, it doesn't matter your skin color, it doesn't matter the diversity of your life, it doesn't matter if you like Starbucks or you hate Starbucks, I want to personally invite you. If you come, come and say hello. Let us know that you watch us on Real, and I appreciate you sharing this television program with a lot of people. God bless. Oh, <laughs>